Imagine a really boring task. I get my students to do this by saying, right, think of a letter from the alphabet. So my last class said Z. Okay, I'll pick another person. Think of a word that begins with that Z. And predictably, a zebra came up. And that's uh, just an easy way to get a really tedious title, the zebra. How on earth would we turn this into narrative writing? I'm going to take you through a simple, I hope simple anyway, six-part process that's going to help you answer this question. First, you're going to start with a spider diagram to jot your ideas down as quickly as possible. Next, you'll eliminate some of these by concentrating on the ones that are fun to write and that will surprise the examiner. Uh, so you only include those two as your selection. Then you have a final um, tie break, if you like, between these two. Um, surprising the reader is more important than fun to write, but hopefully they'll overlap. You then ask yourself, well, what can I do in two pages? Because that's a typical exam for most of you. And then once you've chosen that one, you do a new spider diagram. And then crucially, you get rid of all the rubbish at the beginning of a story and go straight in with a crisis. So let's see how that works. There's my title in the middle, and I literally put down anything. There is no editor in my mind at this stage. Many students uh, sit there thinking, not putting ideas down. Well, I'm going to be crossing ideas out in this planning stage, and therefore everything I think of goes down. So a teenager invents a bra, which makes her irresistible. Um, I've got uh, all sorts of things in mind there that I could write about. Or a code name for a spy on the trail of terrorists. I'll just move that closer. There we go. So that um, I'm picking things that are in the news that I'm thinking of that come to me naturally. A virus that hacks details of everyone's DNA. Again, DNA stories are constantly in the news. Um, and I've gone from code name to virus. It's just... Um, a word association that's just worked for me. So I'm just going to stick it down. And then obviously a zebra is also an animal. So an elderly zebra at the zoo who plans an escape. Um, I don't know, perhaps I'm thinking of something like Animal Farm there. Or many of you will have watched films like Madagascar which might follow a similar plot. Okay, well that is literally a minute of planning. Maybe two at the most where I just whap any idea down. What do I do next? Well, I go through and I mark an F next to all the ones that I think are going to be fun to write. Now, this one I don't really know enough about, so I've just crossed it out, which leaves me with three. Now I have to decide which ones will also surprise. Well, this one, having the zebra as a real animal, is quite predictable, really. I imagine maybe one in ten, one in fifteen people will choose a story that's really similar to this. And I don't want the examiner who's reading a thousand scripts um, to find a hundred that are like mine. That would be a disaster because I'd have to be absolutely awesome in that one to make the examiner think I was particularly brilliant. Um, so I'm left with these two here. So I cross out to the zebra one. Right, I've got plenty of ideas for both of my other two stories. So. Um, I love Paul Jennings' short stories, and uh, they're very similar to this uh, idea of a, an invention where things are going to go wrong. You, at first, they look like they're going brilliantly, and then they go wrong. That's a typical uh, Paul Jennings story, and I can easily do that with the invention of the bra. Um, uh, so, yes, you become irresistible, but then that brings all kinds of complications. Uh, you get attention that you don't want. I could easily do that in two pages, and it'll probably end up with uh, her destroying the bra because it had been too successful. And then I've also read a bit of Michael Crichton, who always takes some aspect of science and takes it to an extreme. So he's the man who wrote Jurassic Park, and you can see, you know, he's taken the idea of cloning and taken it to an extreme. I could do that quite easily with this um, DNA. What would happen if a company got hold of? everybody's DNA on the planet. Um, so I can easily think of things to do with that story too. But 
one of those, or all of both of them, might end up being more like a book than two pages. Uh, so which one could I do in just uh, two pages? Well, I'm going to pick the one that's got fewest events in, and for me, that's going to be the DNA story and not the bra. I'm probably going to get carried away with lots of different scenarios with the bra one, and the story might not go anywhere for too long. So, yep, yeah, I'm ditching the bra, and I'm going with the DNA. Okay, well now I do exactly the same thing. I put my title at the middle of the page, and then I spend one minute jotting down any ideas that I can think of. So it releases your DNA on the website, on oh, sorry, on the internet, so everyone can access it, or it allows adults to be genetically altered. You know, you think about... Um, drugs in the news uh, that's just altering what athletes can do what if they could do that at the level of your genes and uh, then the other possibility it changes your dna so that um, babies can be designed you get designer babies um, people choosing exactly uh, what partner they want from some kind of catalog um, uh, people would stop having babies because they loved each other but because they were the right dna match um, their genetic profiles would match, what would that do to society? Okay, well, all of those three quite appeal to me. I could go for any of them. But the advice is next and finally to start with a crisis, and that will help you narrow down which one you do. Um, for me, that's quite clear. Uh, the one that lends itself to that sort of dramatic crisis, in my mind, is this one, um, you know, because the moment that's released... Um, there's panic. Um, so that idea of panic is what I'm going to start with and I'll just launch into my story um, not worrying about how it begins in terms of where's the beginning idea and explaining to the reader what's going on. I'm not going to do that at all. I'm going to make the reader catch up and that's the great joy of starting with a crisis. And the other thing it does, of course, is it helps you write just two pages because you're not spending a lot of time filling the reader in. You're getting straight into it, and that gets rid of lots of other stuff. Right, well, now you need to hang around for the second part of the video where I show you the story that I began uh, using this technique. Uh, or if you're watching this uh, as a standalone video on its own, follow the link and uh, find the story that I began to write. Good luck. Okay, of all the points in my six-point planning um, uh, map, if you like, the crisis is the most important part. Even if I've come up with a duff idea for a story because I'm under pressure, um, starting with a crisis is going to save me. Let's see how it works. Chloe stabbed furiously at the keypad, swearing under her breath. And then her eyes pleaded with me. They've changed the code, she spat. Disbelief. I closed my eyes, searching for the most likely change. The most powerful company in the world, Futures, holds the DNA of everyone on the planet. Double helix was this morning's code. I opened my eyes again as it came to me. He'd rhyme it. Felix. Happiness. Futures actually thought they were making the world a better place, like all dictatorships. Try Felix. Right, starting in straight with the um, crisis forces me to be dramatic. Look at my choice of verbs. Chloe stabbed. She's swearing. Uh, she's pleading with me. Automatically, the reader is emotionally involved. Uh, more than that, they have to try and work out what on earth is going on. Um, but there are lots of clues. There's a keypad and a code. So they know they're in a kind of um, technology genre. Uh, possibly a thriller, because this code is trying to be cracked. Uh, they know there are two main characters. There's Chloe, and there's me, the narrator. Uh, they know that they're in a near future, because uh, they've never heard of this company, Futures, but it's the most powerful company in the world. It's a world like ours. It's involved with the DNA, so the future isn't too far-fetched. It might only be five or ten years away from where we are now. And they know, again, that it's got a science sort of theme because double helix links with um, DNA. Uh, so, lots of clues for the readers to work out what's going on. Well, what kind of world is it? 
It's probably one where this company, Futures, is trying to take over because I, as the author, have referred to it as a dictatorship. So this is a really useful technique. I grab the reader here with the beginning of my crisis, and then I put in a bit of backstory, or as writers call it, exposition, where I give a little bit of detail about the setting and what's happened previously. Um, we know what this company has done and we know why they're there, they're trying to break a code. And all that is done in very few words, you know, there are not many words on this page, and it's accomplished an awful lot. Chloe dared to breathe again, the door slid open silently, and we entered into a sea of white, our eyes locked on each other. Five minutes, I said stupidly, we both knew the plan and the timings intimately. Four years we'd worked here, brains whirring at optimum from weekly doses of Z, the drug configured individually to our own brains, courtesy of futures. Forgetting became impossible, which made us incredible employees, but a brain that can't forget wakes up every day with pain, your father's death from cancer, the betrayal of your first love, the pain of childbirth, replayed every morning. And worse, memories you've wiped. The first time you slept alone as a baby. Your first toothache. The first time your parents were caught in a lie. Finding out your cat was dead. Slight, inconsequential, meaningless to you. Now, suddenly real. And always repeating. Futures. Your future, poisoned by your past. Right, well, describing um, the crisis in this way allows me to give the characters thoughts. And that's always something that writers um, under pressure in an exam usually fail to do. And the thoughts are doing two things. They're telling me how the character's feeling, uh, this idea of the pain that they're having to suffer. But look at the exposition it's doing. It's giving that whole backstory of what Futures has been up to. And it's given my characters a motive for wanting to attack the company. So the company have been feeding them this drug Z, which uh, has incredibly improved their memories, but the side effects of that is these awful memories never go away. We can never delete them. We can never wipe them from our minds. You know, what a horrible future that would be if you couldn't forget things, or at least forget how bad they were. And then the other thing it's allowed me to do is show you how long uh, my characters have got this is going to be a five-minute story. Um, so the action is going to take place over about five minutes, which means I know I can fit it all into two pages. Um, the extra events are the backstory, as I've suggested, which are intertwined with the emotions of my characters. Uh, so I know I'm gripping my reader, I'm gripping the examiner, and uh, also, it's an exam, I'm gripping myself. You know, I'm not making it a boring writing experience. I'm having fun with it myself and enjoying what I'm doing. And that's important. You know, just because you're writing an exam doesn't mean you shouldn't seek your own pleasure. After all, if the uh, story is going to fascinate you, it's likely to fascinate another reader. But we had not predicted this, the bare white room. Uh, so this is when you introduce um, the crisis further. You go into more depth, um, either the same crisis or a new one. Because it's a two-page story, it's worth um, exploring greater depth to the same crisis. Where is it, Johnny? We needed the mainframe, but the room was empty. Our research was faultless. Four years of living with perfection, working through the ranks. My twin and I had persevered. Last night, it had all been worth it. We'd found the back door to the firewall. Chloe had found it by accident. Mr Hope, chief executive of Futures, had been trapped in a lift with Chloe. It had been a sudden power cut. The processing of DNA for seven billion people needs a lot of computing power. While you sleep, Futures virus taps into your computer, your tablet, your mobile phone. You can't count the processing power or the wattage required. And last night's resulted in a power cut. So starting with the crisis has allowed me to just focus on three key characters. I've got my villain here, Mr Hope, who represents the whole company. I'm not going to introduce lots of other characters, that would be pointless. Too many for the two pages. So I've just got my two 
uh, characters on the side of good, Johnny and Chloe, and Mr. Hope, the villain. Again, in the midst of the crisis, notice how each paragraph starts with a crisis, I can then give that backstory, that exposition, to work out um, why they're there and uh, what the problem is with um, using this password. Sorry, what the problem is with the company. Uh, so the company isn't just attacking our two employees with this drug Z, uh, it's also affecting everyone. There's no privacy, it's using, um, using anything that can go online and possibly using it against you. Right, let's read on. Mr Hope and Chloe alone in a stalled lift. I've put that in a single paragraph because it's going to be crucial um, to my story. I don't know how crucial it's going to be yet because I haven't ended it and I'll explain that in a minute. He pressed his palm to the scanner as a reflex without thinking and began to speak. Butter and then he'd stopped. Nothing happened, of course, because Mr Hope had caught Chloe's eye in the mirror. She had shrugged. He had shrugged. Two employees trapped in a lift. No big deal. But it was a big deal. Mr Hope had a daughter, Faith, and she had a horse, Butterscotch. The password to the mainframe. Now, all we had to do was find it, and it wasn't here. OK, well, this is my new crisis. Yeah, they, they had the crisis of not being able to get the code. Then that was resolved, and now I've got a new crisis. They've got the code for the mainframe. It's Butterscotch. Um, but there's no mainframe. They've broken into the room where they're sure it exists, and it's disappeared. So I've got two choices now as a writer. Um, they're going to find a way to get it to appear, um, get Butterscotch um, into the mainframe, so they can alter um, what Futures does. They can introduce their own vi virus and uh, stop all this information gathering, all this interfering with DNA. Um, so it can end triumphantly with them destroying the company um, and saving mankind from uh, having DNA available just to the company. They could reveal all everybody's DNA straight onto the internet um, so no one would have control over it. Uh, okay, so that's one ending. Um, but the other ending could be that Mr Hope has stage managed uh, this trip in the elevator with Chloe. He knows what um, Chloe and Johnny are up to and this is trap. Um, they're going to do something which uh, he needs them to do which will in fact um, infect everybody. Do you remember I said they were twins? So they could have been a genetic DNA experiment set up by Mr Hope's company when they were young. They knew nothing about it. Um, he's going to reproduce their DNA via the internet and that's going to um, dramatically alter the DNA of billions of people so that they become perfect copies, uh, replicas of these, um, these two villains who don't know it but they become... Uh, they become the norm. So I've got this, uh, these two different ways of ending. One's um, a utopian one, where um, Chloe and Johnny save the world, and one's a dystopian one, where they think they're going to save the world, but they're exploit exploited by Mr Hope, so that everyone shares um, their memory, uh, the computing power of their brain, um, so everyone becomes much more intelligent, but also filled with this kind of pain that Johnny and Chloe have felt. And I can do either of those. Now, why that's important is I didn't plan that ending, uh, either of those endings. I had no idea uh, that either of those endings were possible until partway through my writing. And the thing that helped me do that was my crisis. If I'd started with um, the story of Futures and Mr Hope and then becoming a powerful company... I would have been too worried about um, explaining all the detail and I'd never have worked out where my ending was going to go. But starting in a crisis kind of puts me as a writer into a state of panic. and um, It's helpful panic because I'm writing about my character's panic and as I'm doing that, I'm thinking about the likely scenarios about how I'm going to end. 
So here's a story that's, uh, I don't know, it's about 440-odd words so far. Um, in two pages, I'm going to write about 600. Um, and so I know I've got another 150 words um, to end it, which I can easily do. And I've got options, you know, what will the examiner have? More utopian stories, where things turn out well, or more dystopian stories, where they turn out worse. Um, sadly, I, I haven't read a thousand short stories, I don't know. Um, but probably, for my money, it, I'll go dystopian. And, and that's where I would head under pressure in the exam because it allows me to introduce a further twist. We think they've succeeded, but their success actually results in tragedy. Right, well, let's recap on uh, some of the advantages of starting with the crisis. Um, it allowed me to include exposition, this idea of the backstory. Um, I hope you noticed my sentence starters, that they were incredibly varied. Um, different, um, nearly every sentence started in a different way. It allowed me to cheat with some sentence starters for effect. I started a few with and and but. You will have noticed some incredibly short paragraphs where I was um, playing about with tension. Uh, hopefully you also noticed that uh, in the longer sections I was able to show off uh, linking ideas with colons and semicolons and dashes. Um, not just because I know the examiner's looking for these, but because they allow me to write in contrast um, to my short tense paragraphs. So these two counterpoint each other. Short paragraphs to create tension, and then these longer detailed ones um, to give that backstory again, the exposition. And hopefully you'll remember that linked to the exposition, I'm always giving the character's feelings and uh, by doing that, by giving their feelings, I'm constantly asking the reader to engage with my story. Um, and finally, what does all that do? Um, it all comes together to give me this choice about how I end. And choice is the key ingredient that keeps me interested as a reader. Wow, that's messy, isn't it? But I hope it's been a helpful video. And... Uh, why not write your own story under exam conditions now and see how it works?